And here we are with another episode of our Straight Shooter podcast. I'm Chris Jacobs. I'm joined by Jacob Montalvo, correct? Can you tell me a little bit about how you made your way down to the Valley? Um, I know you had a career in MMA and now you have your own jujitsu gym. Right. Yeah. I'm actually, um, yeah, my name's Jacob Montalvo. I'm actually from Harlingen, Texas. Okay. Um, I started the Harlingen Jiu-Jitsu Club back in 2000 here in Harlingen. We opened up on Jefferson Street. Um, I started training jujitsu back in nine. I started training probably like in right after high school in 98. Uh, so it was shortly after that. I was still a blue belt when I opened up the gym, actually. So it was uh, back in those days, uh, there wasn't very many purple belts or above anywhere around here. You know, we had to travel to Dallas or Houston or something like that to uh, to kind of find uh, instructors for jujitsu. So that was kind of the highest rank that we had down here. So we're kind of the pioneers of jujitsu in the Rio Grande Valley. And, um, you know, starting off with just a handful, of, like 10 students uh, that we started off with, um, you know, it was, it's been a long journey and um, it's been an exciting journey. Uh, we've had a lot of, uh, met a lot of great friends doing this. Um, I did get involved also in MMA. Um, mm -hmm. I did some officiating. Um, and that all came about through the process of training jujitsu and officiating jujitsu matches and stuff like that along the way. So how do you get involved with officiating with MMA? Cause it seems like most people go in to, to want to fight, but you went into officiate. Right. So for, for me, I started officiating probably about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I did my first UFC was UFC 16, uh, 169. And, um, so the way it happened, the way it happened is one of my students was actually involved with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. He was a, a boxing judge. And uh, so I met one of the commissioners from the state of Texas and um, he introduced us. We went to go see a, a few exciting Showtime boxing matches at the Hidalgo State Farm, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he um, he just started talking to me and, and mentioned, you know, hey, what do you you know, you're you know, you're a brown belt. I was thinking I was a I know I was a purple belt at that time of jujitsu. And he he mentioned, you think you'd be a, a good referee for for MMA fights? I said, I'm a big fan. And, you know, I've always <laughs> followed the, the sport, but I never thought or envisioned that I would uh, be officiating or judging or, or even refereeing uh, these fights. But then before you know it, I started taking uh, some online courses. Um, I've done a lot of uh, um ABC conferences, you know, Association of Boxing Commissions, and started just, you know, getting my, my feet wet. Uh, the first event that I ever, the very first event that I ever did was actually here in my hometown in Harlingen, Texas, and it was an amateur event. And it so happened that the, there's usually two referees that end up uh, uh, doing an event mm. when we get assigned, and the other referee didn't make it. So I ended up doing like 12 fights my very first event that I ever did. Rules reading and also that's getting your feet wet right off the bat. So Man, it sounds like, but in, in MMA, it sounds like in all sports, we always criticize officials for, for the work they do. They never get any good, any good credit. But in fighting, the official has the ability to end the fight, to, you know, to do all this stuff. They have a little bit more power, I think. Does that put a lot of pressure on the official? Oh, absolutely. You know, be, being the official, you know, it's one of those things where you're, you know, you, you, you realize like how much these fighters are putting into the fight. You know, they, they take, they take time away from their families. You know, they're out every evening. They wake up early to get their cardio done. They're, they're doing their sparring and, and they get injured and, and they work through these things. You know, none of these fighters ever go into a fight a hundred percent, but, um, it's, it's, it, you got to take all that into account because, it, you know, as amateurs, yes, you don't want to affect their career you know, later when they become pros and when they become pros, you know, some of these guys, it's their average. They could choose to do a lot of different things with their lives. You know, that, you know, some of them are very smart, very smart individuals, you know, they could choose a different life path, but you know, what they're doing is they're, they're doing what they love, their passion. And you don't want to take away any kind of, uh, uh, any, anything away from them, you know, mean like monetary wise, you know, so you got to balance their well being you know, their health, you know, you don't want them to get seriously injured and their livelihood. So it, that's a, a really hard balance to kind of uh, maintain as a referee, you know, because, you know, it, we respect these fighters, you know, and um, we, we never want to like shortchange them in, 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 so to speak, you know, so it is, I, I do have the, the authority to fit, stop a fight. If I feel a fighter's in danger, I am the last lifeline for them. But um, again, we try to let it work itself out. You know, some guys are really good at controlling position and it may be slow wrestling. You know, we were talking about that, you know, it, it might be a grindy, boring fight where the crowd's booing, <laughs> but I let them work it out. You know, I'm one of those referees that, Hey man, it's part of the fight, you know, and I, I'm very strict in my rules meeting when I talk to these fighters and I let them know, 
you know, this is what, what you should expect from me. This is what I expect from you. If I don't get that, this is what's going to happen. So we go through a, a, a rundown of all our, our fouls and our, and our instructions that we're doing backstage in the locker room. And so they go out there knowing, you know, once they hear a command, if they don't react, then there's going to be uh, an action. It's got to be tough for you because a lot of times when I'm watching a fight on TV and somebody who's getting just destroyed and the official says, all right, let's, let's put an end to this. The fighter who's getting beat up gets pissed at the official for saying, why'd you stop it? I was doing fine. So that's got to be, puts you in a tough spot. Right, right. And, and again, that's kind of just boils back down to like, you know, the balance of well-being, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and again, it's in the instructions. I mean, I've had a, a little, a silly story here that, uh, you know, uh, quite a few years back, we had a local event. It was at an outdoor uh, race park in Edinburgh or, or um, McAllen area. And, um, you know, I go back there, I'm doing my rules meeting. And, you know, one of the fighters is, um, he's back there, he's pumped. And, you know, it's, you know, it's one of his first fights, you know, and he goes, hey, don't stop it until I'm out. Don't stop it unless I'm out. And I said, you do your job, I'll do my job. You know, protect <laughs> yourself at all times. If, obviously, if you're out, you can't protect yourself, you know. But uh, so, you know, it, the funny thing is, you know, he, he did come out uh, victorious, but it, it is one of the things where you get stuck in a bind and, you know, fight back, fight back, do something, improve your position. You got to you gotta respond to these commands. And if there's no response, obviously, that's when I'm stepping in. Yeah, it's literally the fighter's fighters will to want to keep keep going and it that is fighting is trying to better your position and it's, it's especially jujitsu right right yeah and that's how it all started you know like i'll backtrack a little bit you know so training jujitsu you know one of my buddies took me to my first jujitsu class back in um and like not uh, the summer of 98 and i just started training here in harlingen and um you know i just fell in love with the sport you know it's just it's one of those things where you have you know, you have so many things going on in life, whatever. The only thing you can focus on is the problem that's right in front of you. And you're just trying to solve it. You're just, it's just a, a Rubik's Cube. You just, it's, and it's a moving Rubik's Cube. So, mm -hmm. you know, transitions, the position's always changing and, and it gets a little tricky at times, but it's fun. And, you know, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the game, you know, it's part of the martial arts. So, yeah. And the martial arts aspect of it is I've always found it to be very meditative. It's very calming for me, but I think it has this huge misconception of if you, if you train martial arts, if you try to box, if you try to do Muay Thai, kickboxing, jujitsu, whatever, it's going to lead you down a violent path. But it always seems to me that that actually is a way to calm yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, some, you know, some students that I see, they come into the gym and their, they, their aspects and their aspirations are maybe to become an MMA fighter, you know, and say, well, and they might associate, you know, my background with, you know, maybe seeing me officiating MMA fights with, oh, I teach MMA. I don't teach, I teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And they come in with the aspect like, oh, um, you know, you look pretty tough. Or can we roll, you know? And then once they start to roll, they start to become a little bit more humble and understand that, you know, it is an art. It is a, it is a, a style, right? It's a, what we're trying to do is control and create leverage for ourselves to then uh, eventually get the submission. But back back to that is like you know when you're training like for instance uh waking up on a wednesday morning and going through my day is probably one of my best days in the middle of the week mm -hmm. because we have 10 round tuesdays so what we do on tuesdays is we we spar for only three minutes 10 times you get a new person every time and so you you release this endorphin you release this um you know for a lot of the men it's a testosterone release or you know they, they get pumped they love going in on those days but you know, you do it so much and repetitive, you feel so comfortable that, you know, when you run into something like, like out on the streets, it's kind of like you're more relaxed towards it because it, you're not threatened by it, if, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. it, it could elevate quickly. But since we release so much, we're the, it's like a regular thing for us to do, you know, Tuesday. Yeah, that's one example. But every day we're in there after technique is done. We do what's called rolling. We do our sparring, our live training, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, that aspect right there does. um does help a lot to have that, 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 I wouldn't say meditation. I mean, you can think of it that way, but it's like self-control of not getting so anxious to, to attack or not getting so anxious to be, to be threatened, you know? Mm -hmm. So it does help a lot. Yeah. You know, the, the truth is people who take jujitsu are some of the coolest and calmest people I've, I've ever met, but in a way doing it is like having a, a gun in some ways, which is you, if you misuse it, it can be this terrible thing but if you use it properly it can be not only fun but it can help save your life in some in some degree um so i think that we have this misconception about violence when 
you see people who train and I don't know, maybe that just needs to go away. Yeah. You know, um, maybe it's the ears right <laughs> maybe it's the the cauliflower ears you know some people get a little threatened by that you know it's a warning sign right but uh but yeah no i've had people say yeah like absolutely it is definitely a weapon i would say but um it's a good weapon it's uh jujitsu um and like let's backtrack just a little bit like you said most of the people that train jujitsu are all the coolest people so they absolutely are i love it and, and and that could be in any case of any martial art me, I say jujitsu because that's all I really know. That's all I mm-hmm. really foretake it, you know. But uh, I, I really enjoy everybody that I've come across. I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of the people that I've come across are all amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's always a, you know one, you know. But but here's the thing: it's just it's so awesome. Um, as far as it being a weapon, like I have had some students that are in law enforcement, you know, particularly sheriff's uh, deputy, where I said. Hey man, I just wanted to thank you, you know, for showing that that arm drag. You know, I, I actually had to use it the other, really? the other evening. Yeah, and it's like it saved my life. You know, and it, you know, it's, it's things, little things, little perks like that. As an instructor, that I really take pride in and say, like, man, I'm. It is for a reason that we're doing all this. You know what I mean? And and just seeing the effects that we have on across the board, all the students, especially the youth coming up, and and having that, um, having that option jujitsu for youth we've never had that before in harlan's we we created that and now it's it's grown into such a huge 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 uh, uh uh opportunity for us to to reach out to all these kids and and give them something you know yeah and you mentioned reaching out to a lot of these uh kids and the youth of the area but you said yourself man this is a packed this is a packed house when the kids come in right like la- uh, i'll tell you like last night on uh, wednesday evening we had a um over 40 kids on the mat mm-hmm. and you know we we do have a 4,000 square foot facility uh it, it's really nice uh but you know it does it, it gets a little crowded so we're, we're you know we're figuring things out how to you know space them out and, and do different types of drills and activities but the number one concept that i really am heavy on i'm technique heavy so i really yeah. make sure that i focus on the techniques and um i make sure the kids are understanding that and, and they love it they, they absolutely um we see improvements on them every evaluation that we do. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So one of the big topics now people always talk about is all forms of bullying, um, how that impacts school, how that impacts your social life and, and everything else with, with young kids. Um, I'm wonder how much martial arts has an impact on bullying in school or a, a kid who maybe is taking your course or taking any martial arts course for that matter how much it really helps them deal with that. Right. Hey, did you watch Cobra Kai on, on YouTube? <laughs> did you see that? Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it, it could have to do with the instructor. But I would say this, like, man, bullying, um, I guess it's been around for a long time. You know, I've, I've, we, we've, we've known about this. We've heard about it. Uh, we've experienced some, um, you know, even in Harlingen recently, we've experienced some some issues lately that's made news, and, and it's very unfortunate that that uh, kids take it this far. And there's a lot of peer pressure going on, and um, you know, it you know, for me, I think it all stems home home base, right? It mm-hmm. could be, it could actually start. Uh, is this a question? Is this direction? Is this a good direction to go in? Right? Yeah, now? no, no, go okay. for it. Um, I feel like you know, like. It, 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 it starts at home. We have to have, you know, the parents leading the way, teaching their kids right from wrong. If you see bullying, you got to stop it. it. And, you know, if you don't, you become, you can become a, a part of a, a, a indirect bullying. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, you see something happening, you can step in. Don't be afraid. You know what I mean? And, and you know, doing martial arts gives you that confidence, that self-confidence to be able to step right. in, intervene. And, and, and do you know, I'll, I'll, whenever I see something, even if I see kids, you know, we, we play in a, a T-ball team. We've, we're three games in now. And, and, you know, even within our own team, we see two kids, but, you know, fight each other. And my, my son went to a daycare with a lot of these kids. They still go to the daycare where he's going to pre-K, but so they'll, some of them will stick together, you know, and this happens, but you know, you got to step in and say, Hey guys, don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you got to discipline them right there. And then while they're young, so they grow up and they have a good a good attitude about that and they learn and they're and they're knowledgeable about what it is and they recognize it um you know you don't want them to get tied up in you know even an indirect thing where maybe it they're not physically hurting somebody but maybe just talking about somebody and then you start laughing just you know we've got to start educating our children to not fall into that trend it's not cool how would you like it if it was you? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We got to really kind of open those perspectives up. And I think in jujitsu and in martial arts in general, the, what I do is, is I make them conform. 
So if I start seeing a couple of kids, you know, messing around, that's the weak link in the team. Yeah. We all have to pay the price to make that link stronger. So I'll circle them up and we'll do a, a, a few reminders. You know, sometimes I go longer than, you know, maybe I'll say, hey, guys, we're just going to do 10 burp, you know, and it's not always a physical thing. It could be a, a meditative thing. Let's sit and think about what we were doing. Give them a good two, three minutes, just mm. complete silence, no talking, make them think, you know. So there's different ways to kind of, for me, to kind of address that. But in no way, shape, or form am I saying you're going to come to my class, you're going to learn these techniques and use it at school. No, that's the absolute last resort. Absolute, absolute last resort. I'm talking after maybe you've been attacked, right? Yeah. But, but for me, I'm still, we're, what we do is we have to figure out a solution to the problem that we're in in jiu-jitsu if we're pinned side control on bottom there's step by step by step instructions we're not just exploding and trying to get out so when you start to see this start to develop in their minds as they're trained to do this day in day out day in day out which monday wednesday friday when they're at school they see these problems they have a solution building system in their mind already where they can start to start here and start to figure out a way to defuse the situation rather than escalating yeah the hard part i think is you can, you mentioned how um bullying is you know been around for a while and um we have to deal with it with, but i would take it one step further which is i think it's more in our nature you know the strong have always picked on the weak and it's always been a test of how can i take advantage of some person i think that's more human nature than it is uh maybe a recent development but the the martial arts the jujitsu and all these hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques techniques um really go a way of go in terms of uh, maybe leveling the playing field a little bit right right so like uh we call it low-hanging fruit at the gym so people will be like hey why are you going for low-hanging fruit like they'll go for white belt right right away you know <laughs> uh, but the cool thing about it if you look like and i'm going to go back to the kids just for a second more um the great thing is i have some you know in, in youth jujitsu we start off at white belts we work to gray yellow orange and green obviously green is the highest belt you can get as a youth and we have several at all levels and the beautiful thing about it is we have a white belt that comes in it's not like the kids at the gym are going to go after that child and attack them we have our orange black belts our green belts working with these brand new white belts they're the partners for them they're the ones showing them hey i've been here for a while i've been where you i remember my first week i remember and there's just beautiful they're awesome it's amazing to see how kind and great these kids are now again it is in our nature to maybe if the stronger person pick a weaker person an easy win an easy victory wasting less energy in a fight to you know maybe look cool in front of your friends but that's why we have to really give them the knowledge to say hey that's not right you know that's this is not this is a uh, something that we teach at the gym that the parents should teach at home above all um and uh that could also go into like you know you hear like there's bullying going on in school the kid got in trouble for two weeks he's back out he's bullying again mm -hmm. the parents never stepped in well maybe and i don't know if you're going to go this way in a while but the repercussions for the kids should maybe be a little bit more severe but also maybe the parent should have some kind of repercussion as well or have some sort of check-in module where they're like okay i've been talking to uh, talking to about it or a counseling situation i mean i don't know how far you can take it with a school district but i mean you know we uh, fortunately we haven't had as much but i guess here we're we're um mainly like a big hispanic uh, uh culture down here mm -hmm. right so where i would say like maybe in other other states and other areas in texas even uh, that you might have more diversity and more issues I, you know i don't know how this all breaks down or if it does or doesn't but uh again uh, i think that it's something that at the household should be addressed and fixed well you and other gyms uh, like yours all over the country do something that i think a lot of times is broken down is you teach a very strict form of discipline because you're you're dealing with and in a sense you're dealing with something that can hurt you uh something that um is in some form violent so you teach discipline and that's the key to to learning how to fight right. is discipline it's not going out and just throwing punches it's knowing when and when not to fight right absolutely um without without discipline there's no mastery right like mm -hmm. so you, you have to have discipline and that, i mean that's so important and, and 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 again you know um 
there's only so much I can do uh, as an instructor with the students. So a lot of my the parents come in, and they're like, "You discipline, do what you got." I mean, maybe they're full at home. They're maybe they've had enough. And and I have had kids. I you know I don't know what to do with my child. I'm bringing him to you because I he doesn't like to do anything. He doesn't listen to me. You know, and it it doesn't take just me though. I'm telling you, I conform. It's the the herd. It's the herd that makes everything work. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The, the team, the structure of it, the, the, the morale of it, it's just, hey, man, you know, get in line. Be quiet. You know, someone starts ch- chitter-chatting, talking. They, they straighten each other out. And, and that's how it, we're making peer pressure an effective, positive thing rather than making peer pressure a, hey, hey, let's, let's go pick up. Let's, you know, look at him. He, you know, he has torn, torn jeans. His shirt looks, you know, dirty, you know? Mm-hmm. you know. And that's another thing. These kids, they don't understand, you know. Um, like my, my, my wife. Um, she, um, she went to private school here in Harlem. She went to one of the private schools here. She didn't get introduced into the public school district until junior high. Mm. And that's when she started to recognize, like, you know, they're, they weren't, they're not like a super rich family, but they're, you know, middle class. And, you know, have to, there's people that have less, you know, and yeah. then, and then you, you started to see like, man, they were really mean to that person or whatever. You just never really know what people are going through at home. You know, you know, so it's just one of these, again, it's just education. Let the kids know, you know, if they, they understand a little bit more, you know, maybe they won't treat a kid as bad for wearing the same shirt three days in a row, whatever it is, you know, we don't know the cause of it, but, but if that's the case, you know, at least they have a knowledge and we could have a different impact rather than bullying. Yeah. And it definitely seems like it's a structural breakdown because if there's no foundation there, like you mentioned with the parents, if that's not there, then nothing else is, is it, it can work. I'm not saying it can't work, but if 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 the home base, if your parents, if your family, if they're not there to to help you along, then it's so much easier for everything else to crumble. Right. right. Yeah, it's definitely huge because um, it, and it's not only like for instance, it's not only like um, I guess it's you could boil it down to yes, good parents, yes, give them the knowledge, teach them, but also monitor what they're doing. You mm-hmm. know, because a whole nother thing is like. They get online, they're on YouTube, they start seeing things, they get, you know, there's certain, there's a lot of things that have changed drastically from when I guess you and I, you know, were maybe in high school or school, the music now compared to the music uh, back then is, is, it's just night and day. It's just, it's completely different. Yeah, it really is. And I was actually, we, we actually at our station ran this story a couple of, I think it was last week um, about this, this trend on, on YouTube now is they, uh, there are these videos that are marketed or somewhat marketed towards children but in the middle of the video there'll be some just really just disturbing stuff that happens you know it's and it's it's yeah, a, it's, about it's kind of like a comedy video it's not really meant for children but you know it it has children characters in it it's got all these draws that would make a kid go ooh that looks that looks like it's interesting or funny or whatever but then it just takes this really dark turn and if you're an adult you go oh i get it that's a funny it's a funny joke and everything but it's so much easier to just access anything online yeah. now now than it has been before. Exactly, exactly, and, and monitoring is huge. And and that's what and, and speaking of online, that's what creates like there's like cyberbullying too. You know, there's all these different things that can happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that man, and it all starts with like, what what sicko would make that right? Like who would, who would yeah. go out, take their time, create that? If they know a child is going to tune in and, and watch that, they get some kind of pleasure out of uh, affecting them this way. Or I don't know, man, it's a society is, you know, we just got to be smart and, and have, uh, you know, good morals. You know what I mean? We have a group of friends, um, man, there's probably about six families that we went to high school together. We still hang out, you know, mm-hmm. 20 years later, you know what I mean? And, and we, we all have little, you know, couple kids, one kid, you know, whatever. And we all, the reason, and we're so different, I mean. Once in banking, some teachers, U.S. Marshal, Border Patrol, you know, we're all different, you know mm. what I mean? And the, 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 the unity and the likeness of all is, is our, like, our family values, the morale. You know, we, you know, we all we go to different churches, but we do have a base in religion. And, and we, we, um, we really, you know, we, it, the family is very important to us, the value of that, you know. So I think that that's important that I think people start to, you know, just really value that because I think – in the long run, that'll make your children, you know, not only behave better, but excel in everything that they do academically, musically, martial, whatever it is that you do and give them those options, you know? Yeah. And that's, like I said, that's really the foundation because without it there, it's, it's so hard to build on, um, interpersonal relationships. It's so hard to develop 
really decent social interaction between people. Um, I was on the top, on the topic of bullying. I, I remember this Gillette commercial. I'm going to get on this soapbox for a second here, but I, this Gillette commercial came out a number of months back and I remember it, the whole point of it was kind of bizarre to me, which is they were criticizing a, a thing called toxic masculinity, okay. like a new, it's like a new buzzword or buzz phrase, I should say. And in one of the, it had, it had these kind of these boys kind of doing things that were typically masculine. And in one, in one case, there was this, this boy who had another boy pinned to the ground and they were fighting. And I remember thinking, and I don't know why I thought this, but I remember thinking, and, but they were portraying it as a negative. And I thought, what if, what if that boy who was beating that other kid up, what if the kid on who was losing the fight was bullying him? You know, what if, um, what if he had been being bullied and he said, you know what, I'm not taking this anymore. I'm taking matters into my right. own hands. And I thought that that was translated really well to, uh, fighting and the lesson that it teaches, which is sometimes you have to take matters into your own hands. Right. And sometimes you have to, um, really not look to other people to solve a problem or to look into a problem for you. Sometimes you say, I'm going to deal with this myself. Right. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired and I'm not going to take it anymore sort of thing. But they portrayed it as a negative. And I thought, well, what if, what if he was being bullied? What if he just decided I'm standing up for myself? Right. Right. You know, and so that's the thing, you know, we give them the tools, we give them the tools yeah. if they need it to, to, to defend themselves. And if that's the case, if he's pinning you know, the, that, that'd be a perfectly good example of uh, a, a good, a good job. Make a professor proud, right? Uh, you know, he's pinning him down. He's not striking. <laughs> he's not over. He's not like overdoing it, you know, like really like, you know, letting it all out. Yeah. He has a controlled state of mind. He could be so upset in his mind. And as five as primitive, you know, primitive us, all men, you know, like we get, you know, we bump our toes, son of a, you know, yeah. you know, we get so upset. You can see like your, your, your buttons are pushed so much. Your buttons are pushed so much. You just take so much. You snap, mm -hmm. you defend yourself. But the line is how far do you defend yourself? Are you going to go excessive damage? Are you going to really, you know, get yourself in trouble now? Or, or where is the line of you're defending yourself and now you've become the attacker. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's that line, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, but yeah, no, I totally get it. I think, uh, I didn't see that commercial, but I'll yeah, you should it check it out. It's yeah. a, it's a totally stupid commercial, but it's, <laughs> it's so dumb. Um, but yeah, check it out and, uh, you, you'll see what I mean. I, I think that it's, I don't, there seems to be this attack on, I don't want to say men, but I remember how I had this conversation with somebody about, um, that I, th I here's how I feel. I think all young boys should learn some form of, of sport, some, and, and especially maybe some form of martial arts. Right. I think that should almost be required in schools. And I, I, and maybe I'm crazy when I say this, but I think the world would actually be a lot better place if that was uh, somehow a piece of legislation or something. Right. Uh, like, are you saying that so it doesn't lead to other, like maybe like bringing weapons and stuff? Are you saying that just, just because maybe... You know they they feel more confident in themselves i think it would be a lot in turning them their self-confidence into something really positive uh, people are i think sometimes young kids can be unsure of themselves you mm -hmm. give them this confidence that you develop through athletics or you develop through some sort of hobby mm -hmm. but i think for young boys i think a lot of times we have this drive to want to be active and physical and we want to tear things up and the hard part is learning how to control that. And I right. think sports and martial arts is a great way to try. That. Right. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, something, uh, I'll give you a little bit more information on some other things that I do as well, besides the officiating and teaching yeah. at my gym. Um, so about eight years ago, I took on the task of becoming the head coach of jujitsu for the Marine military Academy. We have a lot, we have six graders through, you know, high school kids all the way up. Right. So, uh, we, we deal with, um, with a lot of teenage boys, with a lot of, you know, they're Thanks, just, yeah, yeah, they're, just, yeah, they're, they're amped up and they're, they just want to <laughs> learn, you know, and it's really cool to see the transitions in them. So yeah, I do agree with you on that part. This year was my very first year to work with the Harlingen uh, school district at Vernon middle school. And I work with the sixth graders there and I have an after school program every Friday. I'm on week nine, uh, this Friday. Uh, and so it's a 10 week program and I, I go in there, I start off with, um, you know, we talk about jujitsu, we I explain to them what it is. Um, we teach them from stand up, takedowns, control, uh, 
positional work. We've we've caught a few submissions. You know, we haven't got to the live sparn yet. I actually rolled around with a couple of them you know, <laughs> outside of the waiver. But um, and you so, scared them to so, death. Yeah, yeah they're <laughs> like, I, I told them you're gonna lose, right? But you know, I kind of tell them, I let them do what you know, kind of have some fun. But um, the funny thing is, uh, you do you see the change? You know, I had one kid. You know, I had one kid that went in there like he's gonna cause me trouble. He's gonna mm-hmm. just cause me trouble. You know, it's an after school. You know, and and he did. The first three weeks he did, you know, but I conformed him with the rest of them and they all paid the price. And the next time he came in, he was, and he's only missed one class out of the 10 weeks. So he's, and you know, it's, it's great. It's, it's good to see those transitions. You know, it's good to see that in a sixth grader like that, you know, where it's a pivotal moment. Now, I just feel like it is a positive thing for the school district to be doing this. I have um, two other uh, instructors that uh, teach at my gym. And uh, one of them teaches uh, an after school. Well, they both actually do. They both teach at an after school program at San Benito. And it's an MMA. Uh, so it's all MMA. Mine mm-hmm. is jujitsu that I do here in Harlingen. Yeah. But it's an MMA deal. And they've, they've had similar stories. We've, you know, we've had lunch and we've talked and, and, and you know, kind of compared notes. And, you know, this is what I do. What are you doing? You know, so it's pretty cool to hear the same, the same uh effects that it's having on these youth you know sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade stuff like that you know so we have had a history of doing working with these young kids at the marine military academy we're the we're probably the third or fourth school that was a high school I mean, it's privately owned but uh that uh that's done it in texas so that uh, was a pretty big accomplishment for for our part and for mma as well and all the students that are uh, a part of that program so yeah you say you work with these these uh, young kids who you have to conform them basically to change their attitudes and and change their behavior right so what does that mean to conform them so so like you know like i said like you know we'll have kids that come in uh they're not you you know i don't know you you i'm Mm -hmm. i'm i'm bad you know i'm a bad kid you know like i'm you know people are afraid of me you know (laughs) i'm the top dog yeah Yeah. i'm I'm the the alpha alpha (laughs) male in the group right and once it's just funny because i i'm obviously i'm not going to put my hand on them i'll train with them and just toy around with them you know they're they're young kids but once they come into the class and they meet one of the even a yellow black belt one of my kids has been there for three two three years once they meet one of those kids it could be a smaller kid too and sometimes if i get a really bad kid like that that i know the parents just like the parents are like stressed out i can tell because by the way they're talking by the language they're using towards them you know the kid will be just pouting the whole time the parents trying to sign them up they're like i don't want to be here like well you have to you know or you're gonna you know whatever you know so it's like okay i see you're in a bind you're gonna give this to me we're gonna take care of this Mm. we're gonna take care of this today sometimes it takes you know a couple weeks but once they meet that that high level kid that's smaller than them that they're they're no they're embarrassed they don't want to lose anymore because they're going to lose. There's just no way around it. Jiu-Jitsu is a martial art that if you know nothing and you go to that class, you're going to lose because it doesn't matter how strong you are. You know, in boxing, you might land that, you know, that lucky punch. In, in karate, you might land that lucky kick. Come, you know, whatever it is. In Jiu-Jitsu, there's not luck. It's not lucky. It's, it's technical. It's very, very technical. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll purposely put a little girl with a top dog that comes in that I know is so good at like getting to someone's back and just mm-hmm. can hold you there till she chokes you. And that's what happens majority of the time. If it doesn't happen, what happens is they ended up, you know, controlling them until time runs out and they're like, man, I just got controlled by this little girl. You know, that, that starts to, uh, you know, turn the heat down a little bit on that kid. Like, okay, maybe there's something here. It humbles them. Yeah. yeah humbles them. Definitely humbles them. And they're not that alpha man. And you just see the change. So conform them that way. And, and, and as a unity. So I don't have to be the one to be like, I'm going to go and, and, and show you that you're not the top dog. There's other ways to do it by, you know, uh, you know, there's a jokester that keep, you know, the first kid in that class that I was talking to you about, it was a simple task. We we're lined up. There was a dry erase board behind him with an eraser on there. And he kept turning around, not looking. I said, please don't touch that. Uh, pay attention up here. He kept grabbing it, kept grabbing it. All right. Don't touch that eraser anymore. You know, a couple of times, you know. Touch that eraser again, and we're all going to pay the price. Touch the eraser. Like, put the pinky out and touched it. We circled up. We did put the knuckles. You know, this, and this is one of the first classes that I ever did at Vernon, you know, after the introduction. And it was a physical day. And, hey, man, don't be touching that. You know, and one of the kids 
got the eraser, moved it to the other side of the classroom so the kid couldn't touch the eraser anymore. Kind of saved them all, you know, figured out a solution to what was going on. So in ways like that, you know, um, you kind of change a lot of kids' attitudes and you humble them and, and they understand more the realization of you're not the top dog. Um, you know, I have to rely on the guy next to me sometimes for certain things. So as jujitsu is an individual sport, we make it teamwork in a lot of aspects just like that. Mm. You know what I mean? So Yeah, because people don't think of jujitsu as a, a team sport. No, absolutely not. You represent a team, uh -huh. but when you're out there fighting and the life's on the <laughs> yeah. line, it's just you. It's you know what I mean? So it's pretty funny. Yeah, like where do you train? Oh, I train at Harlan's Jiu Jitsu Club. Oh yeah, you're gonna compete Saturday. How many you know, oh you know, I'm the only one on the mat though. You know, so mm. it's, it's it's you know, it's it's stressful, man, and it, it puts a lot of uh, – it's good for the kids, man. I really think it is. It's good for the adults. I think it's great, you know what I mean? So, you know, and the thing is, you know, we have students from all walks of life, you know, young teenagers just graduate high school, want to be MMA fighters. We have actual MMA fighters. We have doctors, lawyers, law enforcement, <laughs> nurses. You know, we have everything, so it's just – it's awesome. Newscaster, you know what I mean? So we yeah, have right. People, so, <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, it really is. Do you think – I, I always wonder if, um, well, I think it's fairly natural to say, um, young boys, and I can only speak for, for boys and men because I, I am one and I don't know, maybe women feel the same way, but when you're at such a young age and you have that natural aggression and that natural desire to want to prove yourself and also a natural curiosity for things, and that needs to be steered in something productive because it what, what's the saying empty uh the devil's i forget what it is it's yeah. something about idle hands or the devil's tools or something right 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 and this really gives uh this really gives those hands something to do but i feel maybe it becomes more necessary uh for young boys who have that testosterone and they're going through puberty and they're really trying to prove themselves to to the world right yeah i mean it's it's a tough time for little boys right but so here's the thing man you know again um we, we are putting you know as one thing that i've always been told like even by my instructor robert defranco you know he's like you know um you you should actually add more classes to your kid class because i used to only train kids twice a week i do three times a week now plus an open mat on saturdays that they want so they could have double now right four days out of the week if if, if they choose to um you know ask what we're naturally born to push and pull you know we're we're yeah you're born with those primitive things like you know kids they start to grab things and they pull and they and, and but we're doing that we're putting some concept behind that you know what i mean as they get bigger and bigger they start to understand now as that age uh you know when when boys you know whatever 11 12 13 14 um but you know it's it is it's a tough time because there's you know they're getting stronger and you know they're you know so they do have to learn to control you know what they learn the tools that they have so again you know i could tell them till i'm blue in the face but again it's you know it's a parent thing it's, and i and i see both sides of it i see that side where the troubled parents coming in looking for a solution and i have the one with the parent that they're overly living through their kids oh they take them to every competition they expect them to win every mm. tournament there and then that's another thing that could maybe drive a kid into man i don't want to do this anymore or or you know they start getting kind of antsy on other aspects so again man it really at the end of the day for me i really feel like you know educate educate yourself be a role model yourself be be who you want your kids to be you know like really try hard and try to you know emulate what you can the best person of you that you can be to to share you know? yeah and then when parents say i'm, I'm looking i need i need some help with this this kid I would, I would always think, well, okay, look in the mirror. Yeah. You're that kid's help. And that's not to say that, you know, the, the parents aren't trying hard, but right. I feel there's always something more that can be done. Maybe that isn't realized yet. Right, right, man. It's just, and that's, you know, I have a, I have a two young kids that have a, a four-year-old and three, or a five-year-old and three-year-old. And it's tough, man, because they, they will push your buttons, you know, at that age, you know. So It's easy for me to say I don't have kids, so <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is, it, it's tough, but, um. But yeah, man, it's just, it's something you got to work on. It's a learning, you know, it's a learning every time, you know, we apologize to our oldest all the time for all the mistakes we've made that we learned <laughs> for the second one. Well, but that's, you know, that's it, what it's about. It's about making mistakes. And then the next generation, you say, Hey, we did this wrong. Right, um, right. But, but the thing is, one of the things I, I think is a problem is we tell the next generation, Hey, we did this wrong. Let's try to improve this. But we never say, Hey, we did this right. Don't change this. Right, yeah. We did this fine. Yeah. It's perfectly okay. Right. right. You know? Um, uh, yeah. So what, 
what is the biggest obstacle people in martial arts face in terms of overcoming that stigma of this is just a brute man's violence sport you know it's it's a blood sport it's it's nothing but cages and uh right cages and and blood that's all it is well i think it was was it mccain that was like hey it's human cockfighting and he was totally against it when they were trying to have a a, a, a meeting in new york and they wouldn't pass mma there and he was totally yeah. against it and now we're like he supports it like now he's a part of a supporter because you see that these people are intelligent people that are in mixed martial arts and, and, and this is the aspect we're talking right like yeah. people they they associate martial arts you know which is in characterized mixed martial arts mma all together you see it in the cage people get cut it's a part of the fight for me i've always thought elbows are the worst i mean if you're gonna ban something don't ban the 12 to 6 elbow just get rid of elbows altogether you know there's certain organizations that do it like uh bellator in the tournament they don't allow elbows because that person has to fight again in a couple months and cuts from elbows are the worst i mean that's uh that's the most dangerous tool i think in, in mm. the body i mean that's it's sharp it's a hard bone it cuts and it causes a lot of damage so yes you know we were or they fighters wear four ounce gloves and, and it protects their hands but to a to a degree um, that's another thing you start looking at there's a whole new avenue coming out in fighting right now i don't know if you've seen this or not but it's called bare knuckle fighting mm -hmm. yeah there, it's huge uh, there was a war uh between uh, jason knight and Lo lobov and it was like a five round war these both these guys looked like they were it was badly damaged it's going to be a lot of yeah like they've been on. in a rough car accident <laughs> yeah. or something bad it's bad oh, they compared one of the pictures of the guys to like the chucky doll he's all cut up scars oh, stitches everywhere it's bad you can check it out later but but you know you you look at it and you you think like okay bare knuckle fighting shouldn't have been as bad as as mma just because it's bare knuckle doesn't really change anything right because if you had a glove on right now if you had a four ounce glove on and i told you to punch this table you'd probably punch pretty hard because there's cushion on your hand mm -hmm. You take that pad, I tell you, punch that table as hard as you can. You're not going to punch as hard because you're going to hurt your hand. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So there's that damage uh, control, right? What 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 are you willing to take for what you're going to give kind of deal? But yeah. obviously these guys in this fight did had none of that. So they were just throwing broken no. hands, broken. No, God, and I, I used to, I played a little bit of rugby. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I've been screaming about with football players is they always say, how do we reduce concussions? How do we do away with all these severe injuries and uh, physical ailments later in life. And I, I always say, take the helmets off. Because if, if you think, because one of the things that the helmet, helmet does is it gives this false sense of security yes. of how hard you can hit, like you said with the like, glove, like and the glove yeah. how you can hit. And if you take that off and there's nothing protecting your head, I guarantee you no football player is going to lead with their head in any way shape or form it might happen accidentally of course but you know that right. i think that would be pretty much cut right in half if you just took helmets off of football players and said yeah that, the rules aren't changing that's but. interesting that's interesting because don't you think we'd have a couple knuckleheads out there that would <laughs> oh man we oh we totally would but you know at this they did that study a number of years back about four or five years ago where 110 out of 111 uh, deceased football players, they examined their brains, had signs of CTE. Right. And I had just, I just have this bizarre feeling TBI. that, yeah, that it, um, that it, without the helmets, you lose that sense of security of, okay, right. I can, I can hit this guy as hard as I want because I'm protected. If you take that helmet and what they've shown is these helmets, a lot of times don't actually do that much because the trick is you have to find a way for the brain to essentially stop floating in your head right. the helmet basically prevents against very minor uh minor concussions mild concussions minor forms of it but i think if you take it away it's it's a uh, it's a different ball game yeah that's a scary thing uh we're huge into like you know the tbi cte stuff you mm -hmm. know the traumatic brain injuries and stuff we study that as referees and officials i mean yeah. we meet with our doctors our ringside physicians you know a couple times throughout the year and we really try to try to get as much knowledge as we can because you know a lot of people say like you know they see superficial uh cut you know blood bleeding from the nose maybe a broken nose uh, bl a lot of blood and, and it, that's not the damage really that the the most damaging blood is the one you don't see the mm. swelling in the brains uh, you know that that's some serious stuff and i going back to that football deal that we we're talking about i recently saw a I think it was Junior Seau, 30 for 30. Mm -hmm. That was really sad because there's a, 
you know, there's some 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 studies that, that show that going back and all this this brain injuries, all this stuff here is causing like depression and it could be causing other things and and he ended up, you know, obviously taking his own life, mm-hmm. you know. Um God rest his soul. He's a great, you know, one of the greatest linebackers of all time. Oh, he's you know? a tremendous and football player. Amazing. Yeah, he's a Hall just, of Famer. Yeah, he's great, you know, and, and to see something that if we would have just known that sooner, maybe we could have taken steps to, you know, prevent, you know, something like that, you know, and, and there's technology with these helmets and stuff, I know, but it, at the end of the day, it is a fall. I mean, that's that's serious stuff, man. These guys are running full speed at each other, leading with their head, and their heads are just crashing that's dangerous have you noticed the concussion debate in football because that's where it pretty much got all the headlines and that's where all the attention was drawn to have you noticed it moving its way into mma and people having more of a debate there absolutely yeah we we have we we actually um so every year we have a conference at the uh, association of boxing commission it's called the abc i always do the referee course all the doctors physicians they all meet all the you know inspectors everybody everybody basically meets and um it's been it's been a huge thing for many many years already now actually so uh it's a huge thing um we we look for signs you know i mean one of the worst things so there's there's a couple of things that we so some people say like <clears throat> hey man you know you saw that guy was caught in a choke and when you get choked out you get knocked out there's no brain damage there though there's no trauma to the brain where you're getting hit mm-hmm. i'd rather let somebody get choked out completely any day of the week than you know one punch you know they, they don't even have to go out they don't have to go get knocked out but their brain just boom shifts you know it rattles uh, yeah the, the, one of the things is uh and this is you, what's an even bigger debate and i'm kind of jumping around here no, go for but, it. but what it is is um the dehydrating the the cutting the weight cutting that these guys have to do to fight that's something weight. i've always wondered about too what happens is their fluids are completely depleted out of their bodies. It, their cerebral fluid is depleted. So their brain is bounced around in nothing, like very, very little fluid because they're draining themselves. They're, they're severely dehydrated. You're talking yeah. about, about a guy that weighs over 200 pounds, 200 plus, cutting down to you know one, 155. That's Jeez. crazy. Yeah. That's insane. That's, that's nuts. So, um, so that's something that you gotta, we got to regulate a little bit better, I, I, I believe. But again, with time, when you rule, I think one one fighting championships in Japan, uh, they're doing it a little bit different, where they they measure how they measure your weight hydrated. You have to pee like hydrated before you fight. Really? Yes. So it's really interesting, and um, we've uh, there's been a couple of transitions of, of fighters going from like UFC to one. You know, mm-hmm. Sage Northcutt's one of the big names that's actually going to be fighting real soon uh, on that. So it's going to be real interesting to see how how much better they actually perform when they're not just sucked out, dried out. And, and, you know, they're fighting. It's horrible. I mean, if you ever had food poisoning and you were throwing up and you feel horrible yeah. and then have to get up the morning in a fight or that day in fight, that's how these guys probably feel. I don't know. I mean, I've never put myself through that much of a weight cut. I, I would bet that's a big part of it. Yeah, that they it, just feel incredibly sick when they're fighting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, and then they're replenishing as much as they can. Yeah. They gain all this, they balloon back up, but it's that's the last thing to like get the fluid back so the the brain injuries is, is huge so so dehydration uh the the brain the brain is huge I and mean, we doctors are always doing pre pre-fight checks post-fight checks i mean they take really good care i mean i've been in instance of fights where um you know a fighter's been knocked out you know one of the scariest events for me was a. Uh, these always tend to happen like at like smaller regional local shows than the bigger UFC. I mean, the guys go out all the time. Obviously, you mm-hmm. see it on TV. But these local shows where a guy goes out and he's snoring for like a couple minutes, those are the scariest moments of any of anybody's life, right? Like it, it, as an official, you know, you just see this guy. You were you were it was your job to stop it, and you know, the impact happens. You stop the fight. The that the imminent. Uh, what's going to happen next is going to happen because the strike already landed. That's a finishing strike. That's his finishing sequence. I stopped the fight. This guy is asleep. Put him in the best position you can. Let the doctor come in, remove the mouthpiece, do, you know, try to rub his chest, try to get him up. He gets up, goes to the back, then feels very nauseated right there. That's your sign. That's going to be, you know, that's going to be concussion because, yeah. you know, all the vomiting and stuff like that from, from a severe knockout like that is just the worst, you know. You get this roundhouse kick, you know, and yeah, you and, become woozy and you become, uh, uh, you get, you might get vertigo after a little while and you can't balance right. yourself. It's horrible. It's, I mean, yeah, it's a ho- terrible feeling. You know, and, and, the, and those are the things, man, you know, you feel bad, but you know, 
the, the, the flip side of this is they're, they're fighters. They sign up for this. They know what can happen, but you're still there. You're the lifeline. You got to jump in and you got to officiate and you got to stop these fights at, at proper time. One punch too much is too many, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and, and another quick little story. I, um, I think this was a, maybe a couple years back. Uh, I actually refereed a Jason Knight fight against okay. Chad Skelly. It was a UFC fight night or UFC event. And, you know, pre-fight, given the rules, we go out and uh, they're both studs. I mean, they're both awesome. I think I think something happened in the second round where Chaz actually got his arm broken by an arm bar, but got out. Mm. I didn't know. he. Did. I, I always go to the corner to try to listen in between rounds to kind of evaluate where the fighter's at. And uh, no complaint of it, you know. Um, you know, I asked the inspector, hey, keeping, I think something happened. I thought he broke his hand throwing a punch, but he actually, he did break his arm from an arm bar and he came out of it. That Jeez. was in the second round. No, it was in the first round. I'm sorry. Fought the whole second round. Looked good. Third round. I mean, this guy's an animal. Jason Knight's got him. He's, he's got him trapped. He's punching him. And the only thing, I mean, I'm in close. You could hear the commentary, you know, Joe Rogan's like, <laughs> why is this referee stopping the fight? Uh, this guy on bottom getting his face touch. He's like, don't stop the fight. I'm okay. Don't stop the fight. He's yelling at me. Do not stop the fight. I'm like, fight back, fight back. You know, I'm giving him every opportunity that I can to stay in this fight. Eventually, he gets punched a couple more times. I stop the fight. He gets up, fine. He walks, and then he starts to stumble. I catch him. Herb Dean's there. He's like, that's all I, I, I like to let him walk and stumble because, you know, it's to let him know that was it. You were done. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird because the, there was a little backlash. Like, you should have stopped it sooner. You should have stopped it sooner. While the whole time I was in the cage, I had him lined up. You know, Bruce Buffer's doing his thing. I'm raising the hat. And he's like, why'd you stop it? Why'd you, you know, he's just so persistent. But sometimes that's where it comes into play. Fighters are too strong for their own good. They just want to keep going. They just, and they're, they're vocalizing. They're telling you they're okay. Don't stop the fight. But you know that there's a, there's a, there's a time. And that was a time, you know, and that was the right time. I thought, I thought the execution of the finishing sequence was great. Um, but again, it's just, it's hard. That's, that, that's a hard balance right there to try to say, like, when you did I stop it too, too early, you don't want to let it go too long, but. Well, when you get in that fighting mentality, fighters really have the, the soul of a, a dog where that you, in the sense, have to save them from themselves. Right. So that's like, like I was saying earlier, that's got to be so difficult for officials as you're seeing somebody just get pummeled repeatedly. And they're at the same time telling you, I'm fine. I'm right. okay. I'm right. okay. Don't do anything. But right. you know they're not. You're like, well, I, okay. Yeah. It puts yeah. you in that bind. In front of 20,000 people, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like, okay, man, I know you're, you're telling me you're fine. And that's the first thing, you know, the first thing that you don't want is like, you stop a fight. Everyone's like, hey. And he gets up. He's like, why'd you stop it? So you got to get it into that little great, that little area where like, okay, he's definitely not fighting back now. Mm -hmm. There's no offense coming back. He's not defending himself. How many of these is going to take? Boom. You're looking at the reaction to these strikes. And it's not like it's not like he's going to punch him and look at me. Punch. No, this guy's in there to kill. He's punch, 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 non -stop. punch. It's nonstop. It's happening. There's no instant replay, by the way. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so yeah, it, it's challenging. But, again, I, I love what I do. I take what I do very, very seriously. Um, I try to get better at what I do every single day. And um, it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you learn from too, you know what I mean? And, and maybe a little stricter rules, a little stricter rules, meaning which I have done, you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're strong enough and able to tell me you're okay, show me, don't tell me, show me and start to, you know, start to work your way out of that. Yeah. Position. I was watching a fight, a number, this was, I don't know how many years ago, but I, my, my mom, dad and I were all watching a fight and the same thing was happening where he was, this guy was on top of another guy and he was just starting to unleash on him. And I remember my mom asking me, she's like, well, why doesn't the official end it? And I, I said, well, because his, he still has his hands up. The guy on the bottom is still right. defending himself. He may be getting hit, but his hands are still up so he can still defend himself. So when I think when the official sees that, they say, well, he's still in it at the very least. He's right. trying to protect himself. So they're not just going to end it because it, it doesn't look right. good. Right. So and what, that's funny that, that you say that because I, in my rules meeting that I do, um, Every, every time that I have fights, I say, having your hands here and you're getting punched is not intelligent, intelligently defending yourself, okay? <laughs> so you got to do something. You got to show me something. You got to fire back. You got to find a way out. You got to risk control something. But just having your hands up, to me, it's not intelligently defending it's yourself. Not? It's not? It's not. It's not. So if your hands are up and punches are getting through, I know your hands are up, but you're not defending yourself. Oh, man. The punches are getting through. So, yeah, we've, we've kind of 
and that's something that I that I do. But and again, from the common fan or somebody that really follows MMA, that's not what we're looking for in in, in defending yourself. Yeah. Okay, we got to find a way out of this position. We got to fire back. We we got to show you got to show me that you still want to be in this fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and it's going to take more than that. So I'm very strict about that, and I explain to them, you know, um, uh, that before the fight, so that we're all on the same page, and they're not surprised if I do jump in and stop it. So, so is the strategy of letting your opponent punch themselves out? Is that not really an effective <laughs> strategy? Man, I don't know. Some of these guys are cardio machines. You see Max Holloway in the last fight, man. Yeah, they, he's like a cardio machine. That guy has no stop. John Jones, man, that's a guy that like. Uh, there's no break in the fight. I mean, he's constantly kick. I mean, you know, he's a great wrestler. That's what he was like known as a like, being a, such a great mm -hmm. wrestler. His submissions have come a long way and his kicks, his length. He's so good at controlling like distance with his length and stuff. So he's a big uh, guy. He's a very big guy. He's, he's, he's huge, man. So, uh, so yeah, it's really interesting to see, uh, to see fighters like that. But yeah, that, so punching yourself out, I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe if you were fighting Butterbean or something back in the day, you know. And, but then one of those punches lands and you go to sleep, right? So, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like it's it's dangerous. I don't know. I don't know, man. You so, And you know what? Some guys, they're not in a fight until they have blood on them, like Diego Sanchez or something. Like they That's just where have it to, starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So For them. Like, yeah. So you see, like, they take so much damage and that, that excites them, that pumps them up, and, and then they're in the fight, you know. So uh, there's several guys like that, but – uh you got to just be careful, man, because the officials backstage will tell you what they expect from you and what you, and, and you know, you're, you're not at the UFC. You're not a newbie. Mm -hmm. You've, you've earned your way there. And we know that, you know that. So, um, you know, again, it starts at these regional and, and local shows. You yeah. Know. I would imagine for a lot of people, once they, once they get injured, they're like, okay, now I'm awake. Yeah. Now I'm, now I'm feeling good, which I don't know if that's the best, <laughs> best way to operate, but, um, it, there's something about when you get hurt and you start to feel that first bit of pain, you go, okay, I'm ready. I'm good to go. I don't know if it's a rush of adrenaline or a rush of testosterone or what it is, but something wakes up inside you once you start to feel a little bit of pain. Right. Or maybe the, 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 what is it? The threat of failure, you know, like, oh man, there's no way I'm going to go maybe. down now. Right. So there could be a lot of things playing factor in this, but, uh, but yeah, that's interesting. That's a, you know, we've seen a lot of the survival instincts. Right. Kick in and exactly. You, you're kind of getting cornered. You say, okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes now. What is it? Kill or be killed kind of deal, right? Kill or be so, killed yeah. attitude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. maybe. But on the, on the topic of the injuries, do you think MMA will suffer in any way because of the concussion debate? Um, no, but you know, we, we have some great doctors, man. You know, mm -hmm. we have, you know, actually the, the lead doctor for the ABC for many years, Dr. Loveland. Um, he, I, I work with him a lot in Oklahoma for Bellator and he's just great, man. They're, they have so many meetings. They're, they're, they're just so great at, at everything. You know, they're, they're always getting better. They're finding better ways to, to examine these fighters, to treat these fighters. Um, now it's, it used to be like a fighter would get cut. They'd have to like ambulance them to the, to the hospital suit. I mean, a lot of these events have doctors that are great sutures like on site. Yeah. Like where he's like, they'll basically take you back stage and suture you. You know, they have a little area, they'll suture you up and you're good to go. You know what I mean? So I think that MMA as, as it looks violent, it's very controlled. We have 32 rules and infractions during the fight. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, a lot of protocols that we have to follow. We do cage checks in between. We, everything is done. Like if you notice, like sometimes you see like all these fighters are tested and in between um fights you know sometimes there's blood on and it's a canvas mat in the ufc and some of them are vinyl they're in there cleaning it they have a spray that they you know it just like disinfects and, and tacks the mat up a little bit so they're very safe about a lot of things man you know what i mean and uh and i say that across the board with all a lot of organizations but starting with the fundamentals of the having really good ringside physicians is so important i know here in texas we have great doctors man you know great 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 doctors um they're they're amazing man the, the stuff that they do and the, you know and then and then you also have the the cut men that are just amazing mm. you know what i mean and and they, they work miracles sometimes man you're like how can that guy come out for another round and yeah and you would imagine that in any really physical contact sport yeah. they have these physicians on the sidelines and you know you see collisions in football or you see hits in in martial arts where you say that guy is not coming back from that but you know in football especially the next week they're out yeah, there yeah. playing again and you're thinking man that guy had to go undergo some serious recovery to make it back out there that fast yeah so i think like as a mma community in the industry that we work in um it, it will come under attack over a lot of things and it has been under attack for 
like you said, TBI and, and CTE and, and, and different injuries. Dehydration is a big one right now mm-hmm. too. Um, but the doctors, man, they're just amazing that the organizations that, that the commissions themselves from state to state, we're starting to get more unified. That was one thing that was different. So the difference between, let's say, let's just do a little example, NBA playoffs, the San Antonio Spurs that live in Texas, they have to go play the, the Lakers in California. If they play in Texas, the rules that they play there are the very same exact they play in LA where they play in anywhere they go. The rules are always the same. In MMA, we don't have that. In mm. MMA, it's state to state, every jurisdiction. You know, Some people allow um, uh, certain things like a down opponent that's different in, in, uh, in different states. There's, there's some rules that change from state to state. So that makes it very difficult for not only the fighters that actually fight and say, hey, what's a grounded opponent? One hand, two hands, a finger, you know what I mean? What is really? it? A knee? Yeah. The clear point is if a knee's down, that's a down opponent. In in like in Oklahoma, when I do the Bellators there, two hands have to be down. Okay. Bearing weight, whatever it is, two hands gotta be touching, right? In Texas, it's one hand. One hand, that's a down opponent. So so basically in Oklahoma, if a, if a guy a Texas fighter goes to Oklahoma and he's like this and he thinks he's safe, boom, there comes a knee or kick to the head, total legal shot. Whereas here, it's illegal. And that's across the board. Um, there's only a few states that are kind of moving fast. Obviously, the fight capital of the world, Vegas, uh, Nevada, uh, mm-hmm. they, they've adopted these rules. Um, I think California's working on it. N- New York hasn't got there yet. But there's there's different. Um, I didn't know that about the fighting rules. That's got to make it so tough on yeah, fighters who yeah. were traveling or who have to, I guess. Officials. The officials that travel and they have to, like, yeah. you know, Dan Murgla comes from Jersey. They have different rules there. They come here to Texas. They go to California. He's in Vegas. You know, there's guys that travel all over the place. Herb Dean, for one, man, all over the place. Imagine Big John McCarthy's job. And jo- Big John yeah. McCarthy, he's awesome, man. Like, he's a good friend of mine. He's uh, he he's created a lot of these rules. He was one of the guys that wrote all these rules at the very beginning. You know, he's like, mm-hmm. they had to have some sort of rules. You know, if you remember the, some of the old UFCs, they were like, by, like head buddy pulling hair and <laughs> they stuff were doing like some that. brutal so, stuff. Yeah, punch into the nut. You know what I mean? It was <laughs> yeah. crazy. Those rules didn't come into play until, like, I think after UFC three or four. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they got together. So, actually, you know, Big John McCarthy and his wife are, like, a, a big part of, like, the, the MMA rules and, and all these commissions and stuff. So, he's he's great, man. It's pretty awesome. Do you think they should go to a uniform set of rules? Or do you think they should keep it each individual? I mean, we have unified rules. Yeah. We have that. But the thing is, from state to state, it is legislation. It is legislation that has to be passed and everything that before we could actually change the wording in our rules. So that's a big holdback. But there's been a few. There's there's just you know there's just work that has to be done. I think that eventually we should be able to get there. And you know and you know for the for the hopes of our sport, you know what I mean, our industry. I think that it will. It's awesome. You know, we do some uh, some fights we do like in Indian reservation and stuff. And, and the cool thing oh, I bet is those are cool. Yeah, they're so awesome. They, they're they so amazing. I like to give a shout out to the Windstar World Casino because they're just amazing there. Yeah. The Chickasha Nation. They're just great. Uh, so, yeah, um, we uh, we have a, a different sets everywhere. But the, 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 the lead executive directors in these jurisdictions, see, it's their job to go to these ABC conferences that I'm talking about and kind of adopt all this information and, uh, and share with their with their jurisdiction and, and make the rule changes. You know, they're the ones in charge. They're the ones that can do it. You know. So, yeah. When you say they're changing rules on dehydration and how to train, you said that they test you fully hydrated. So, what what specifically do fighters have to do to to pass those dehydration yeah, tests? Yes, I'm not exactly too sure, man. I I will have to look it up on one. Um, with one, they're the ones that are doing it right now. Mm-hmm. One fighting championships. Um. But I know I just saw like an interview with Eddie Alvarez because he just made his debut there and he said he felt great. Uh, they had to do a test like whatever it was. It was like they had to weigh in like I think uh, a few weeks before hydrated and then like a couple of days before. But if they didn't make the weight, if they weren't hydrated, they had to weigh in again or some, something like this. Really? Yeah. So it, it, it is it's a uh, it's challenging, but they're doing it. Um, I don't know the exact format. I don't want to lie on a podcast, but no, you're fine. But you, we can definitely look that up and see what what the exact process is. Yeah, and I I remember watching. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Foxcatcher with uh, did, yeah. Steve Carell, but there's that one scene with uh, a Channing Tatum in it where he's I think five six pounds overweight and he has an hour or something to right. to drop that weight, and uh, the the scene is just brutal. But I remember thinking, God, that cannot be. That cannot be healthy. We always think of concussions as being, oh, you, you don't want trauma or whenever there's blood, you, you, you know, it's, it's gross or whatever. But just that training that 
that force you have to put on your body to be able to drop weight and drop it fast. And then when you turn around and you start drinking water again, and then all this weight starts to come back on you really fast, that cannot be good for you. Yeah, it's dangerous. I mean, these guys live, you know, it's, it's really hard. And, uh, and that's something you got, you got to respect for them when they're going in there and they're fighting. That's why it's, you know, again, makes the job a little bit more, uh, you know, makes you think more, you know, like, Hey man, what's what's at stake here? You know, what this guy, what did he put up? to be here you know what i mean so yeah it's it's a part of the fight and you know these guys man they're 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 passionate about it you know yeah well how much of amateur fighting is people who are doing it as a hobby and they really just enjoy it that's they do it on a weekend or something yeah yeah there's some guys that are like that you know the 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 guy that trains a little and and you know i've actually done some amateur fights where uh you know I've, i've seen the same guy fight and same guy lose and I, you know, they, you know, the way they do it, regional shows is, you know, like if I f- drive up to Corpus, they get us a room, they put all the fighters in the same room as the hotel, you know, at the hotel with the officials and guys outside like, Hey man, where do you train? He's like, I don't train. I like to fight. I'm like, wow, that's, that's crazy. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> just has a good time with yeah, it. It just has fun. You know, he's, he, you know, but you know, that, that's, uh, it, it, you know, they come from all walks of life, man, you know, and, uh, yeah, and I imagine there's a lot of people who say, no, this isn't just a hobby. This is, this is a big part of my income. This is how right. I'm going to be no, making absolutely. my money. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's different for everyone. And, uh, you know, you, you see, you, when you think you've seen it all, something, something else happens. Mm-hmm. And this is the evolution of this whole, this whole sport, man. It's amazing. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. And there, there's one, one last thing, uh, before I let you go, I wanted to get your take. There's this I didn't even know this existed, but apparently it's a sport in, I think, Eastern Europe somewhere where it's a combination of MMA and sumo wrestling. And they have five people. There's five people to each team. There's there's five people on one side, five on the other. And what they end up doing is they their their um, their gear is like MMA gear. Uh-huh. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've seen this. You I haven't. No. And what they do is they just they ring a bell and the two sides clash and they start just punching and kicking and everything. Is there any officials in this fight or in this game? There are officials. It it was a sanctioned event. And I, I do remember seeing an official, but the whole point is to get the, uh, the other five out of the ring you want. And that's where the sumo wrestling aspect of it. So it's it's just five people going at the, another five people Uh and you have to try to get them all out of the ring, but they're punching, they're kicking and they're trying to wrestle you out. And it looked, I remember seeing that thinking, man, that looks brutal. I want to sign up yeah, for that right I, now. Yeah. That looks so I need, cool. I need to see that. I, I've never seen that. Uh, I would think you would need some more officials, though, right? Definitely. Did you say five on five? or It's five on five, yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot to watch, right? It is, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot, lot to, to watch. It's that's just chaos when you're seeing it. Yeah. So I didn't know if you had seen that. I just recently saw it on social media, and I was no, like, I man, haven't, I haven't seen I'm going to ask Jacob about this. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah no the newest thing for me like i said was that the whole bare knuckle fighting and, and that's been around for a little while now but uh well, that's how boxing kind of started on the docks yeah. you know with the irish wasn't yeah. it yeah 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 man absolutely so they're going back to the roots right the, oh man <laughs> going back old school yeah, very much no uh no gloves and you know but the funny thing is they do have a lot of support around the wrist which is very important you know so they're not breaking the wrist but but still the hand is bare and and it's it's vulnerable so uh so yeah it's interesting I definitely got to check that out. What is that called? Is it? I have to look that okay, up too. Yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll look it up in a second here. But yeah. but yeah, when I saw it, I just thought, man, that's <laughs> if that came to the states, I would tune in every time <laughs> for this. This looks like so much fun. You know, and at the end of the day, <clears throat> on that note, you know, this is all entertainment, man. Yeah, it's all entertainment. Um, unfortunately, people really do get hurt, and that's real. But this is entertainment. The business that we work in is entertainment, and uh, you know, you, you can't stress that enough. Yeah, people make their lives out of it, but it's just another form of that you know you go back to the old days in the coliseum and stuff and you see people went out there to like see someone die or see someone mm-hmm. get killed, you know exit whatever it is right but this is just modern day gladiators man and, and we're entertained by that that's our society you know and some people some people do have a like kind of frown down on that um i i particularly really enjoy it I've been, i'm involved in the industry but um but education is, is huge, man. Once we learn that, you know, what these, you know, some, some of these fighters are, are teachers. Some of these fighters are professional businessmen and they come and they fight and, you know, they have, they have other outlets. They could be doing other things. They choose this. They love this, you know? So, uh, but it is entertainment at the end of the day. And, and that's, uh, one thing to always remember. It really is. But one thing I view 
MMA as or mixed martial uh, as martial arts in general as is it's really a simplified version of life. I feel like people who say I frown on this um, on this sport because it's violent are people who've never necessarily had to really fight in their lives. They've never had to really um, take something head on, had a real struggle or anything like that. So I feel that sports and especially you know martial arts right. is just a simplified version of of the struggles we face in life you have an opponent it's just very simple you have an opponent and you take it on sometimes you win sometimes you lose right right yeah and you know that's 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 a good uh outlook on that um you know but and the funny thing is that you start to see like these fans you lose they start to turn on you You know what i mean so it's, it's <laughs> yeah, tough it's that. rough man these guys have it so rough but it, it's amazing i love it they're great sports the you know majority of them like we said about the jujitsu fighters you know uh jujitsu practitioners they're 99.9 percent .9 of them are all awesome yeah this is the same thing in mma you meet the coolest guys that are you know in wars and you know and just like hang out with them afterwards they're just amazing smart people that you know it's what they do you know it's just great man so, well the people who've overcome struggles and had to really fight in their lives are like I said, they're the most level-headed people. Sometimes they're the most rational people. Right. They're they're very reasonable uh, a bunch. So, and I think I think when you do that either on a mental level or on a physical level, as you do in MMA, it's right. it's just it makes for so much so much better of a person. I think if you, when you struggle for something, absolutely, you really yeah. appreciate the value. Yeah, yeah, it's like anything else. Right? Yeah, so definitely, yeah, it's a good outlook. Definitely. That was great, man. No, the, yeah, there's a blast. Um, we're gonna have to have you on again sometime soon. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it, man. No, no, no. It was great. Um, cool. Let's wrap it up. We did a little more than an hour, so that's pretty cool. Cool, man. Awesome. The time flew by pretty quick. Yeah, it goes. It goes by fast. All right. As always, you are watching the Straight Shooter Podcast. We are less formal, but more informed. Let's tune in next time.